Welcome to Two Titans and a Hunter, a Destiny 2 podcast, a show where we discuss tips, tricks, and tools to help all Guardians succeed and enjoy playing more. What makes us different? Well, we're not streamers or YouTubers, we just have a passion for Destiny and are dedicated to keep Guardians informed and up to date with the latest Destiny information, news, and opinions. We encourage your questions and feedback. Contact us by email at two titans and a hunter at hotmail.com or on Twitter at the number two titans underscore hunter. Now on with the show. Hello and welcome. I am joined today by Titan, who has spent the last week honing his precision skills in Gambit. And I am also joined by a hunter who has graced us with his presence, not only in Gambit, but on this podcast this week. So guys, we've got a lot of information to go through. There's been some Vidox, there's been a This Week at Bungie, there's been Reddit posts, there's been Twitter posts, but we've managed to collate it all together up until the point of Sunday evening, and we're now going to go through it all with you guys, and hopefully it helps you with the new update of the season of The Drifter. So let's get into it. So Bungie say on March 5th, The Drifter takes center stage for every player of destiny 2 the season of the drifter will bring a new offering of rewards and challenges as ranks and crucible gambit and vanguard are reset new pinnacle weapons will be beckoning guardians to reach their maximum potential again the first spring event for destiny will reveal a familiar forest in bloom with a fresh loot across the spectrum of all action and activities you'll earn more power triumphs at law and vanity Players who own Destiny 2 Annual Pass will receive our second extension for the Destiny Endgame. This time, it's the Drifter who will be your dealer, with the evolution of that little game he likes to call Gambit. So, new information that we've learned since the Vidoc and the This Week at Bungie. There'll be a new location for the season of the Drifter, with the Derelict, the Drifter ship. There'll be a new location in the Tower... Um, in the annex for the drifter so this is where people were glitching in and finding a moat bank for quite some time and the gambit director is changing up with the regular gambit it will be on the left of the screen your prime will be at the bottom of the screen private matches will be on the right of the screen and the reckoning will be at the top and then over on reddit there was a post by django117 Hey, real quick, do you have to complete the stuff for the Black Armory to access the stuff for Joker's Wild or Season of the Drifter? They said in the Vidoc that you do not... It's its own thing. It's welcome to everyone. So that means if it's welcome to everyone, that tells me that people that don't even have the expansion still have access to it. So, I mean, ipso facto, if you don't have the expansion and you get access to it, then you obviously don't have to finish the expansion to do it. That's what that tells me. Okay. So, yeah, he was just asking if he had to finish unlocking all the forges to continue on those characters. And they said that basically, no, you can just jump straight into Season of the Drifter. Anybody want to take the next bit? All right. So up next, we've also got some power bounties in, you know, after we spent a whole bunch of time last week saying, hey, here's here's how you can power your character up to, you know, current level to play the new content. Well, Bungie's like, don't worry, we got this. Hold my Mountain Dew. Bungie has heard feedback from the community about getting up to the level for the forges, so that's why they've added some new bounties. So if your power level is low and you want to get caught up with the rest of the community, see the Drifter to complete some new power surge bounties. There are enough of them to bring your level 50 character up to 640 power. So the power surge bounties will be blue gear to help you to the new level in a couple of hours, and you'll power up to 640 with that new gear. You will, however, need to own the annual pass to get access to these surge bounties. So if you're just playing Destiny 2 without the annual pass, you're not going to get these surge bounties. So you've got to keep grinding or throw down your, I believe it's $70 for the annual pass, which will get you access to this content, um, and then the next uh, DLC drop coming in the spring. So we've got a big Season of the Drifter roadmap ahead of us. So there's a whole bunch of content coming. March 5th, this Tuesday, Season of the Drifter starts. We're going to get Gambit Prime. We're going to get the Reckoning Tier 1. We're getting the new Gambit Prime map, the new Arcadia, which has a light and a dark mode, which seems seems interesting. I wonder if there'll be anything different about those. We're getting a Gambit Private Matches. Then on Friday, we're getting Reckoning Tier 2. So I'm assuming there was going to be a power level jump, you know, maybe Tier 1's at, you know, 650, 660. Reckoning Tier 2 on Friday, we're going to get that. It's also Xur's first visit of the new DLC, and he will be having Forsaken Exotics in his inventory. We don't know if we're going to see any week one, but they are in the inventory as an opportunity. They're not going to be in that engram you can purchase from him, but they will be in the inventory as an option. 
So on March 12th, in addition to the Gambit Prime map, Deep Six on Titan, we're getting the Thorn Quest and the first Vanguard Allegiance Quest. Now, Bungie describes the Allegiance Quest as, you know, previously forecasted as the Joker's Wild weekly quest. So again, when you hear Joker's Wild, now think Allegiance Quest. We will invite you to choose between the Vanguard and the Drifter. Pick a side to progress through a quest from their perspective. The pledge is character-based, so if you have more than one Guardian, you can play both sides, so choose wisely. Then, on March 15th, that Friday, Zer comes back, he brings the Zer bounties. What are we going to have to do from him? We'll find out. He'll bring bounties. We're also getting the Reckoning Tier 3. So if you've enjoyed your first two Reckonings, enjoy your third Reckoning. It's going to be good times. Then on the next Tuesday, March 19th, we get Gambit Prime. Legion's Folly is dropping. Then, again on that Friday, Zer comes back. He brings new goods. March 26th, on that Tuesday, Gambit Prime, the Emerald Coast map drops. And then on the next Tuesday, April 2nd, Gambit Prime, all maps are going to be available. And then in private matches, it's going to be Gambit Prime, New Arcadia, and Deep Six. So I assume that means they're going to add those new net maps into the into the private matches for Gambit. And then April 9th on Tuesday is Arc Week. I don't know what it is, but I'm stupidly excited for it. I hope it's something amazing. I'm ready for Arc Week. April 16th to May 6th for three weeks is The Revelry. And as Bungie has said, we're going to hear more about The Revelry coming soon. So get ready for Arc Week, get ready for The Revelry, and all the other Gambit Prime and Zero Bounties that are coming up. I was going to say, something that we learned after the This Week of Bungie and the Vidoc is that there will be a new exotic quest available for everyone just before the Revelry. And the Revelry could be similar to the Dawning or the Festival of the Lost event. So expect some new armor and things like that. And I think we did see a clip of that in the Vidoc with sort of like a green, like flowery kind of armor set for all the different characters. Yeah, it definitely seems like Bungie's, you know, it's going to be Bungie's spring event because it runs for a couple of weeks. And now, again, all this new stuff, you're not getting everything. So if you're, you know, the stuff that's coming, they'll be free to all players. Let's run down real quick. Your Gambit private matches and your new maps, free to everybody. Your power increase is 700. You're getting that. The new vanity rewards, new triumph, new lore books, new rank rewards, getting all that stuff. An exotic quest, we assume it's going to be the Thorn. You're getting that. Iron Banner, the Revelry event, and Arc Week. Everybody gets those. Now, if you're an annual pass holder, if you've thrown down for the three three DLC annual pass, you're going to get Gambit Prime. And then, of course, the Gambit Prime weapons and gear. You're going to get the Reckoning. You, the invitation to the of the Zion from the Zerg bounties. So again, if you want Zerg bounties, got to get the annual pass. You're going to get an exotic quest. Now, it has an exotic quest on both the annual pass holders and the free to all players. And also the allegiance quests are going to be for annual pass holders. So if you're excited about Gambit Prime or the Reckoning or the Invitation of the Nine Zerg bounties, you got to pick up that annual pass, which I believe is about $70 at this point, which gives you access to the Forge DLC, gives you access to Season of the Drifter, and then the next one coming up, which I've now forgotten the name of. It was Penumbra. Yeah, that one. So just going back slightly to your the Allegiance quest. So the choice that you make will follow you throughout the season. So they've released that little tidbit after the, the Vidoc. So basically, you're you're going to make the choice, and that's going to follow you through the season. So it's good if you decide you're going to do one path with one character and another path with another character, so that you can see both sides of the story. And we don't know if that's going to progress into the next season. I'm guessing it's going to do, because I think this is the way Bungie's going to go with the thing. And the Invitations of the Nine, basically you'll, you'll pick up the Invitations of the Nine from Zer. And once the objectives have completed, it will transfer into a bounty, um, and that will be called Into the Unknown. And these will be available to complete one per character per week, similar to the bounties that you got at the beginning of Forsaken for completing an activity with a full set of gear. So week over week, for the nine weeks, you'll collect the new lore and powerful rewards from Zer from doing these bounties. Zer has no system in place, so if you miss a week... It's similar to the Queen's Court. You'll have to make sure that you visit him for the nine weeks. Not sure if it's nine weeks consecutively or it's just nine weeks in total. So Respawn, from Sir anymore. are you wanting to take us through Gambit Prime? Is this your, your section? Yeah. Bungie says Gambit has evolved. Gambit Prime is where you prove you're a Gambit veteran. Choose a specific combat role and build a new armor set with perks that will change the game. With only one round to choose the winner, teamwork will be king. You have four different classes to choose from. First one is the Reaper. You use this to clear waves and or slay larger enemies. The Invader, 
as the name says. You hunt your opponents and steal their moats when you invade their side. The Collector. They specialize in collecting all the moats and sending blockers to the other side. And then there's the Sentry. They are the ones that counter all invaders and protect your bank from said invaders. In addition to that, there was some new info that came out after the TWAB. First of all, Gambit Prime is a one-round match and should last between 6 to 10 minutes. Power levels will, will work the same as they do in normal Gambit, basically in the, the invasions only. The perks aren't on the armor. The armor is how you unlock the perks. Okay, There are lower tier perks, which you can rock as well. Perks can change over time for Gambit Prime for the different tiers. The perks are not tied to the armor. And each armor set is associated with a set of perks for specific roles. Now the armor comes with something called an Aura Glow. It will work only once you've unlocked all the pinnacle perks on that gear. Primeval Slaying will have new mechanics, similar to a raid, in order to DPS the boss. You can still wear exotics, and you can still get the pinnacle perks while wearing said exotics. Multiclassing, similar to Division sets, where you can wear three armor pieces of one to unlock a main perk, and one or two pieces or two separate of another to unlock lower perks using the synths. You can mix and match perks. The perks are only active in Gambit Prime, but you can still wear armor anywhere, and it can still have the mod slots on it and random rolls. As an example, the Collector's Armor set Pinnacle Perk is to collect 20 motes and unleash an extra large blocker. The Invader's Armor Pinnacle Perk not only locks the bank whenever you invade, but if you go hang out next to the bank while you're tearing apart the other team, you'll actually be able to drain the moats from their bank that way as well. Also, another little interesting thing is if you happen to have two or more blockers on your side of the field from the enemy team, it will actually begin to drain the moats in your bank. So the Gambit matches will be decided with 100 moats in lieu of 75 like previous Gambit matches. Over time, you will unlock perks on Gambit Prime armor sets with four different options for playing a role via the armor sets in Gambit Prime only. The game will not hold you in a queue until there's one of each type. Equally, you can potentially have four invaders on one team opposing you. Also, in addition, you can tell what role they are just by looking at them before the match begins based on the glow of the armor at the start of the match. It doesn't seem to be armor locked to a roll, so as a sentry, you could still invade if you want. Playing Gambit Prime will get you an item called Synths. These will drop continuously in the Prime mode. No farming lockouts. Yay! So if you haven't seen the Vidoc, or if you've seen it and you just didn't notice, if you go to the 7 minute and 56 second point in the Vidoc, you'll actually see something called a Taken War Beast. Also, we have a public service announcement. In regular Gambit, the meatball will not be tied to the full curse week any longer. So it will appear more often the more you play. And there's Gambit Prime bounties as well as normal Gambit bounties. Just a little tip, maybe if the Sentry, because they're built around invaders and invading, using the Malfeasance is a good way to play. Gives extra damage to the invaders. So, who'd like to go through the Reckoning? Did you want to go through the Reckoning as well, or...? Would you like to do the reckoning? <laughs> all right, all right, all reckoning. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I got and it. Darker, all right, here we go. Angrier, drifter. So there's going to be a new PVE activity called the reckoning. Winning a round of Gambit Prime is only the beginning. The drifter has a whole new extension of the Destiny Endgame. Take your rewards and risk them in a new challenge that belongs to the Nine. Confront swarms of enemies to unlock greater rewards that you can take with you into battle. There's new lore. You can complete bounties to learn more about the Nine and their place in the universe. There is now Pinnacle PvE within this space. You can drop into chaos and fight your way through challenging enemies. And you can earn gear. You unlock armor and perks that will make you the ultimate competitor in Gambit Prime. There's a timer continuously counting down but there are things that you can do which will gain you time on the clock. Lars Backen from Bungie says, Synths are dual purpose. You can use them to buff the way the perks work with the armor, and also you will be able to put the synths into a portable bank that the Drifter gives to you. This will then create a moat you can take into the Reckoning mode. Once there, you'll put your moat into the bank. Go into an encounter that, if you complete successfully, will have a chance to drop the specific armor piece you're working towards for that tier. You can stay in the Reckoning as long as you like. You will still get rewards for playing, but you're not going to get Gambit Prime weapons or armor 
without the synths being banked. The Reckoning is a four-player experience which can be matchmade for all three tiers. The possible power levels for the different tiers could be 650 to 660 tier 1, 670 to 680 tier 2, and 680 to 700 tier 3. So, new armor and weapons. So the annual pass content in Season of the Drifter provides new paths to earn some of the best gear in the game. Build a loadout that complements the way that you fight. Master a combat role that will make you irreplaceable on a Gambit Prime team. Some of the new weapons available in The Reckoning are the Spare Rations Hand Cannon, Soul Survivor Sniper, Doomsday Grenade Launcher, and there is more to be announced, but pictures on blog, auto, pulse, and scout rifle currently exist. Okay, there was a question over on Reddit. I hope you can mis- restrict what type of armor you get from the Reckoning. I don't want to get the Collector, the Blocker, the Breaker, and Killer armor set and not get any Invader pieces somehow. And Cosmo from Bungie responded, you get to choose which armor you pursue. So that's quite interesting. Bungie be is not RNG-based rewards. So I'll have a chance at actually collecting a full set of something. Yeah, but yeah. it's now you're now gambling. Like that That's what I like about it. It's not rng but you have to be able to complete it to get it, right? Yeah. Because you have you, you you're sacrificing moats that you get, right? And you got to place them as like a like an Anian in a poker game, and hope that you win. Otherwise, you lose your moats and you don't get the piece that you want. So, ha! I will gamble. I will gamble all day long. I will go for the drifter. We'll flip coins. We'll play anything. We'll play blackjack. We'll play the reckoning. I don't care. I will play anything with the drifter as if as long as I have a chance and I can sort of control my own destiny. If I if I you know put my put myself in put my moats up and I get stomped, fine. I lost. I get it. But I'm tired of. I go up. I play the game. I succeed. Oh, here's a blue rifle. Good for you. Oh, here's a blue helmet. I hope you enjoy it. Basically, the, my escalation protocol experiences. So I'm really happy that you at least. Hey, like I said, I'm happy to gamble. I just don't want straight. You know. RNG roll the magic numbers and say, "Oh, you lose every single time, seventy times in a row." Sixty <laughs> percent of the time, it works half the time. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I I wish they would really fix, honestly, is the whole once you reach max light level, right? Stop giving me whites and greens and blues, right? The only thing I need at that point is legendary. Give me my legendary uh, items so I can break them down and get legendary shards from them, right? Why on God's green earth are you still handing out blues and whites? I'm I'm way beyond that tier. Stop giving them to me. Don't want them. Don't need them. Don't need to have them. Right? So what you're saying is, is you'd like to go back to Destiny 1 where they were finally like, hey, instead of giving you blues you have to delete, we're just going to turn them into the materials for you. Another thing we lost from Destiny 1 to Destiny 2. Yeah. So, Pinnacle Chase. Shall I talk about it once anyone else is dying too? Yeah, you, no. can. you can do that one. So, new season, new Pinnacle weapons. Each player of Destiny 2 will find their rank reset in the Crucible, Gambit, and Vanguard missions. At the height of the ranking system, Guardians will find rewards that double as a implement of destructions and trophies. So kill people and look good doing it. Earn the right to carry into battle the piece of evidence of your prowess. Sandbox de- designer Victor Anderson is going to de- into detail and unveils the three new pinnacle weapons available to all players coming with Season of the Drifter. So, we've got, for Vanguard, we've got the Oxygen SR-3. It's a solar precision scout rifle with a unique perk of Mega Mega Nuera. Watch me yeah. butcher this. Mega Nuera, which is basically Dragonfly deals more damage based on the number of precision hits made beforehand. So, get a bunch of precision hits. Hit, you hit that Dragonfly precision hits. Kaboom! Everyone dies. And put the Dragonfly mod on that. It's like, hold on, I got this. I'm going to headshot someone, and the entire world just comes burning down. Now, in the Crucible, we've got the Recluse. It's a void, lightweight submachine gun with a unique perk, Master of Arms, which is kills with any weapon improve this weapon's damage for a short period of time. So come in with your hand cannon, come in with your auto rifle, do some damage, get some kills, switch to that void submachine gun, mow people down, finish them off. That should be an interesting one to use in Gambit as well. Power that thing up and just mow through some mobs with it. And then, of course, coming to Gambit, we have the 21% Delirium, which is an arc rapid-fire machine gun, as opposed to those slow-firing machine guns, with a unique perk of Killing Tally, which is the kill increase kills increase this weapon's damage until it is stowed or reloaded. So, new perk alert! Unlike the other two seasons, this one also has one of the new weapon perks we're introducing for Season of the Drifter. 
overflow to kick the magazine size out even further for true spray and pray action. So we're also getting some new perks on our weapons and I would assume armor in season of the drifter, as well as these new, new weapons to play with. So we've got a, we've got a machine gun that's going to overfill itself and just go to town mowing through things. And then um, DMG has a question on Twitter. Uh, will previous pinnacle weapons like the breakneck progress by completing the reckoning mode? And Cosmo says no, but Gambit Prime matches will count. And then Enkutch has a video on the preview of the new pinnacle weapons of which one is best to get first. So what do you what are you guys most excited about? The scout rifle, the machine gun, or the submachine gun? I'm gonna go with the scout rifle because Meganura is it sounds pretty pretty nasty. And I hope, like you're saying, it actually does stack with the um with the uh oh, fly mod. Thank you. Yes. Yes. If it stacks, that's gonna be that's going to be disgusting. <laughs> There's no other way around it. That's going to be absolutely disgusting. That could be real inter- interesting uh, going to, into the reckoning with all those all those thrall running at you. Headshot, headshot, headshot. Oh, a big guy. I think I'm going to go for the delirium, uh, the, yeah. the the rapid fire frame. I mean, they're both going to be good. Because I mean, they're both absolutely The possibility of keeping that machine gun going with a rally barricade or the transverse steps or your, your hunter dodge. I don't know if the hunter dodge is going to work. But to keep that technically, it's a reload, so I don't think that's going to work. It might work. It just depends, doesn't it? But mm-hmm. being a Titan, I don't care. Rally barricade, it goes. <laughs> yep, yeah. you've got a half wall. You can shoot forever because reloading breaks your immersion. It's way more immersive to never reload the gun and just keep shooting it forever and bringing down primevals and everything else. So I think it's going to be, you know, you go to your respective NPCs to start off the quest for each pinnacle weapon. So check the tower before you do anything that day after reset. Also, I, I've just recently seen a video from Astacross. Astacross has put a video out going over some SMGs that you might want to use because um, Astacross surmises that with the Redrick's Broadsword quest that you had to get pulse rifle kills in the Crucible. So mm. going off of that, he's surmising that it, possibly you're going to need SMG kills in the Crucible for the new smg so he's gone over a few smgs that you might want to check out that either have static roles that you could pull out from your collection or ones that you could possibly get good roles on from the gunsmith so i'll link that in the show notes because that's a really interesting video to watch as well so moving into this week at bungie colorblind settings respawn did you want to tell us about that as you are our colorblind resident I'm not colorblind totally. I'm just slightly colorblind. There's a difference. No, I thought you might want to take this one. <laughs> okay, well, the colorblind mode, it's... I don't really know what to say about it. I mean, the, the colorblind is obviously going to affect the colors of your different armors, right? So if you're like me, who have the yellow-green colorblindness, everything is going to shift to the, the, the reddish-purple spectrum for you, Right. It's going to be it's not going to be yellow yellow green it's going to shift to a different spectrum that way people like me can tell the difference i mean it's what destiny already does so i don't even know why they specify that right if you have colorblind on it's going to change colors so i think that with this one they've with each specific role they've they've tailored the armor and the the colorblindness mode to i think enhance them so that you can um yeah no i get that but better. what i'm saying is like what i'm saying is if you've already got the colorblind mode on like me, right? Yeah. Them doing it individually or putting a filter on the whole screen isn't going to matter. Now, if you're not colorblind, then this right here is a way to affect the color of your armor without changing everything else in the game. So I guess you could look at it from that perspective. So this isn't for colorblind people. This is for everybody else. <laughs> no, it's for colorblind <laughs> this is, people. This is for you guys, right? Because no. colorblind people are already going to see it in our perspective colors because we already have the colorblind turned on. There's no difference for us. For you guys that aren't colorblind, you can turn on the colorblind mode and it will affect your armor without affecting everything else, from what I can tell here. Okay, so Nate Horbaker from Destiny basically says that rather than applying a filter over the whole screen, we've changed only the content that uses the color as its primary messaging to players and greatly impacts their moment-to-moment decisions in the gameplay loop. Each case is handled individually and authored by hand to ensure that we're making the best decision possible. Most forms of colorblind have only two dominant colors. For situations like this, we have to get creative with color saturation and values to ensure each role is as identifiably possible. 
So that's what they have to say from Bungie. So, weapon previews for Season of the Drifter. Bungie say exotic power weapons in Destiny have been the go-to for quite some time due to getting most bang for your buck and raw damage. These changes, along with others that will be shown with the full patch notes for 2.2.0, are revealed, are intended to make legendary power weapons a good option for those who enjoy their exotic kinetic and energy weapons. We believe that the exotics that you choose to run should be an expression of your playstyle rather than the maths working out in your favour. Exotics will always have their unique properties, but a well-rolled legendary weapon should be able to compete in raw damage with an exotic power weapon. Although the legendary weapons may need conditional setups, mods to outright match. Nonetheless, the gap should not be so wide that you, the player, feel that necessary to run an exotic in that specific slot. So with this change, the grenade launchers are getting a PvE buff of 25%. The reserve ammo increase on most grenade launchers. In most cases, the grenade launchers gained three rounds in reserve, but this amount varies based on the perks that you have, like field prep, etc. Magazine perks and mods no longer affect the ammo reserves. Grenade launchers had a bit of a reserve issue due to the magazine having an impact on reserves, and as a result, the reserve total wildly changed, typically not in the favour of the player. This was addressed and they got a PvE damage bonus on top of it to make them more competitive in that slot. So, rocket launchers. PvE damage is increased by 60-65%. to 65%. The exotic rocket launchers have had their damage tuned separately. Cluster bombs. The damage reduction is by 80% on the cluster bombs. So, the riven cheese that's been going on, that's going to be affected. But... With that damage reduction on the cluster bombs, you're getting the 60 to 65% damage on the initial hit. So the loss of the damage from that main projectile is then going to be brought up to nullify the, the reduction from the 80% of the cluster bombs. So they, Bungie say that rocket launchers were entirely too dependent on cluster bombs to be effective, like the full auto perk on shotguns. Cluster bombs would nearly double the damage output of any given rocket. But see, hold on. Before we get too far ahead, there's a couple of points cool. that you brought up that I wanted to address. Okay. First thing is about the whole legendaries and exotics thing, right? On yeah. the one hand, it's cool because legendaries are going to be brought up to exotic status, right? So the weapons are going to get more powerful. That's great. But the elephant in the room here is that just means that exotics are going to be less relevant. What, what exactly is the point of an exotic if it's just going to be the same... Okay, so at this point in time, when the legendaries get brought up to the to the same competitive damage output as as a uh, exotic, right? Then the pinnacle weapons are going to be the equivalent to an exotic. Because at that point, the only thing that's going to separate an exotic from a legendary is their special perks, right? No, that's what they're, makes... only, they're basically saying that it's just the heavy stuff that they're touching, like the grenade launchers, because they were finding a lot more people were running the heavy exotics rather than using a primary and an energy weapon exotic and they want more people to use the primary and the energy weapon exotics rather than having to run your queen's baker or your sleeper simulant or your thunderlord in that power slot you can still do that but there'll be other options there for you so with like machine guns will probably be brought up slightly to you know, match or be able to match roughly the same as the Thunderlord if you put mods and if you get a good roll on them. That's what they're saying. They're not saying that they're going to bring everything up. Okay. But still, in that case, all right, so even if it's only the power, even if it's only the power weapons at that point in time, it's it, you're still facing the same thing, right? Because at that point in time, the exotics will just be a legendary with a special perk, i.e. just another pinnacle weapon. You see, if the if the exotics aren't going to have the damage output in addition to their respective unique perks, then I don't view it as an exotic anymore. At that point in time, it's just like a, a pinnacle weapon, or it's just a slightly better legendary, and that that upsets me. Even if it is only the power weapons, still the power you know? weapons are still going to be the go-to. If you want to use those power weapons, they're going to be the go-to, and people will still use them. It's just that there's other options out there now for you. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair, but. Still still uh, <laughs> i mean I, I don't like them bringing up legendaries to exotic levels right exotics 
need to stay at exotic levels. Don't get me wrong. I, I appreciate them bringing up legendaries, right? But bring up a legendary to the point of like another legendary, right? Another powerful legendary, right? Do that. Don't bring them up to the status of exotics because then you're you're getting rid of the relevancy of an exotic, you know? Yeah. They're supposed to be powerful. They're supposed to be unique. That is that is literally the point of an exotic. And they know? still are. And they still are in their situations. Like that's one thing I was I've been trying out some different gambit loadouts this week. And and I play with the exotics that I have never touched, I've never played with before. And I'm realizing more and more, and I'm sure I'm late way late to the party on this, you know, every exotic has its place. Sometimes it's just finding the place for that exotic to make it truly shine. Some of the perks you look at and you're like, this is a garbage PvP perk or a garbage gambit perk. And you're like, mm-hmm. but in a strike, this could be amazing. In PvP, this is amazing. You know, in in this one, you know, this one boss yeah, in one like raid, in this fortress. is the thing that I need to use. Yeah, exactly. There's you know, everything's gonna have its moment to shine where it's like this is the, the place to use this. And it, and you know, and, and I mean Bungie's doing what they've they're what they're continuing to do is just trying to say, hey, everyone's using these six guns. We gave you all these guns with all these random rolls, use more then than six up, of them. Bring up other exotics then. That's what I'm saying. Bring up other exotics that way people pick different exotics. Well, don't that's, nerf that's the basically, that's basically what they're doing by saying, no, you know, they're hey, bringing you know, up you, legendaries. You, that's what they're doing. Right, they're bringing up right, legendaries to exotic status. Right. But they're also bringing up other exotics saying, hey, if you're always running a, an exotic in that power weapon per, in that power weapon slot, which I rarely do anyway, they're saying, hey, now you can run an exotic, you know, in one of your, your kinetic or your your secondary slot. You don't have to always use that power weapon. You know, they're bringing up other things by saying, hey, we're taking away like the three things people are going to all the time. So you, now you can feel better using it somewhere else. Yeah, but then then that that uh, still see, okay. Most of the time I'm like you. I don't even have a power exotic. I have the hammerhead or a sword or I don't really have a rocket launcher anymore since since machine guns came out, right? So I used to have the uh gamut uh rocket launcher, the the masterwork one. And I, I would have that all the time. And then machine guns came out, and then the, the forge came out. So now I have the hammerhead, machine gun, and the sword, right? So we'll have a moment the, of we'll have a moment of silence for the bad omens with the tracking and the cluster bombs that the drifter gave you for uh, resetting <laughs> your rank. That is now no longer going to be quite as fun. Although it will be useful against the prime evils and that might meatball in the sky because all that cluster bomb damage fell to the ground and did nothing. Right, yeah, and, th- and that's that was my second point, right? They nerfed cluster bomb damage 80% and gave it to the primary projectile, right? And in that case, you've gotten rid of the relevancy of the cluster bombs. This brings me back to Destiny 1, right? Gallahorn. The Gallahorn was the only rocket, as far as I can remember, there's probably others in there, people will correct me, but as far as I can remember at this point, Gallahorn was the only rocket that had not only clusters, but tracking clusters. Right, and those clusters did bonkers damage, and that's why that's why it was so good. Right, I got to experience that for a week before they nerfed it because that's when I got my Gallahorn. <laughs> but then after that, they nerfed the clusters. It was only the clusters, if you noticed. And as soon as they nerfed the clusters, it became almost irrelevant. Like it completely changed how the gun functioned. You know, and by them doing the doing it to the clusters n- here, n- I would say the Gallahorn never became irrelevant. It was more relevant. Like when they nerfed the clusters, people started to use other weapons. You can't deny that. It became people a thing. started to, but the Gallahorn was still. I, I think until probably if you get on Destiny One, you know, LFG groups now they're still going to say, "Hey, we're running this. Bring your Gallahorn." Yeah, but like, I mean, they're, they're probably right. I'm not going to argue this fact, but my point here is the whole point of a rocket with cluster is to have the rocket hit do some damage, and then the clusters fall to the ground and do more damage. That's why we have two different kinds of cluster rockets inside Destiny 2. You have the one where the clusters spread out really far, and you have the one where the clusters kind of fall close to the boss, right? Because you're using the clusters to an advantage. Like, hey, I want to hit the boss, and I want to take out all of his adds or do a lot of damage to all of his adds in a wide area. So you use this rocket with cluster. Or I'm doing, you know, a single target boss, and I just want to do as much damage as I can to him. So you hit him with the projectile, and then all the clusters fall to his feet and detonate there, right? If they take away the cluster damage by 80%, that's not a small amount. Not by any standards. 80% of the damage, at that point in time, What's going to happen? You hit the boss with a projectile, and then the ads underneath them get pelt with frozen peas? I mean, what the hell? <laughs> you know, why 80%? That's going to make them almost irrelevant. So, again, 
give a moment of silence to the to the masterwork rocket launcher from Gambit that you had to reset your rank for twice to get because it's going to be even more relevant, right? Or you if, or you head drop for you really quickly like I did for once. Yeah, the bad omens. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, the bad omens. Uh, you know, moment of silence for the bad omens because not only it, it, if the if people were still using it after swords, after the good uh, forge sword, and the hammerhead came out, if people were still using the bad omens, this right there got rid of them. Nobody's going to be using bad omens or cluster rockets after an eighty percent nerf to the cluster. And if you are, you're trolling your team. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to wait till somebody reputable like cool guy puts a video out and says these are the damage numbers and this is what's changed before i make an assumption on that to be honest moving on to new exotic armor and weapons for season of the drifter bungie have confirmed that it's going to be new exotic weapons and armor for season six so new information that we found out after this week of bungie came out uh, it appears that there will be a pair of exotic gauntlets for each class and this has been seen on the Bungie blog posts. There's pictures of all the different weapons that you can get. And people have spotted the gauntlets for each class. They're very different looking. But they've been secretly put into these this big block of pictures of weapons and things. So don't know what they do yet. But it's going to be interesting. It may only just drop in Prime or The Reckoning. And the exotic weapon that people are thinking that is coming due to the Vidoc and pictures that have been released by Bungie is the possibility of a rail gun. So this is something new to, to Destiny, but it's only a possibility at the moment. It's just like something out there in the community that have, people are saying that possibly could happen. So you say it's a possibility, but because if you remember in the leaks, there was a tab that showed railgun, right? And you can clearly see in the picture with this gun, right? I don't know what kind of railgun it is. I don't know if it's going to be like a like a sniper railgun or like an auto rifle railgun or whatever. But you can clearly see there are two rails side by side with a round in the middle. That That is a railgun, right? Okay. There's no denying that that is a railgun. Now, what kind of railgun is it going to be? Will it be exotic? Will it be legendary? Are we introducing railguns as a whole class and we're going to have a, you know legendary railguns or whatever? Like we have fusion rifles, linear fusion rifles. Um, we we are definitely getting it. Question is when? What kind is it going to be? And are there going to be more? It's going to be a rail gun. It's going to shoot little toy trains. They're going to go choo choo and chase you around the map and then explode. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. It's going to be like the train version of the colony. It's going to be incredible. Look, if that is the case, then it better look exactly like Thomas the Choo Choo Train. If it doesn't, I'm boycotting Destiny. I'm exactly. putting that out there right now. The rights are they're under underway to get a hold of the rights because he thinks he can, he thinks he can, he thinks he can, he thinks he can. <laughs> a quick side note from DMG. He's put out a post on Reddit, I think it was, or Twitter, basically saying that they're updating Year 2 armor with Update 2.2.0 to feature random roles on stat packages. So what was once locked to mobility as a stat package can now roll with heavy, with restorative, or a mobile stat package. So this is for armor, like in the last Wish Raid, where it was mostly mobility, wasn't it? Respawn? Yeah. It was including the, the new mobility. Gambit Prime armor. So anything that you've previously got won't re-roll, but anything that you do get going forward in 2.2.0 will have the possibility of these new random rolls. So that's quite good. Who would like to take the Eververse update? For the next season hey guess what guys you like eververse mm. no neither do we guess what now eververse is gonna have things that are even more exclusive to her and force you even more to do microtransactions if you want the cool gear and or emotes Ta-da! all right so everybody who is cheering yay bungie left activision bungie's all alone everything's gonna be amazing welcome to your eververse seasonal update so which each <laughs> season we have an opportunity to update our goals surrounding Eververse and the ways player en- players engage with it. In Season of the Drifter, we put more of a focus on giving players control in the way they acquire items they wish to equip. The dev team says, Last year we talked about our efforts to give you more control over how you purchase Eververse items. We released the Prismatic Matrix as an experiment to partially address this, but we believe we can do even better. For Season of the Drifter, we want to try something new. 
will be removing the prismatic matrix. Instead, each week there will be a unique bundle available that can be directly purchased for silver, not bright dust, for silver, allowing you to directly buy exactly the items you want. All unique bundles will also contain an exclusive vanity item available only in that week's bundle. If you currently have any prismatic facets, you can still use them up until March 5th. After the beginning of the new season, they will turn into expired prismatic facets and will dismantle into 150 bright dust. The bright dust storefront will also continue to offer a direct path for acquiring items found within bright engrams. As always, they'll monitor feedback, ways to improve. You know, this is an experiment. It's always an experiment. Yeah, I think that's their way of getting out of a lot of things with the Eververse. They go, this is an experiment. We're going to give you this as an experiment. We're going to do this as an experiment. And then just wait for the, the, the backlash. Yeah, so basically... Breaking it down, Eververse, Prismatic Matrix goes away. Now things will be in bundles purchased by Silver. So it's good in a way. If you want an item, you can just, you know, it's in a way it's what players have been screaming for. I want an item. Let me just purchase that item. Let me just buy that item versus saying, let me let me roll the dice. Let me roll the dice on this new package. Oh, I got the thing I didn't want. Or Prismatic you know, Matrix. Oh, there's eight things. There's eight things. I'm going for the ship. Oh, I got the helmet again. So at yeah. least it's giving players a way to purchase things directly. And then, but it is going to cost real money. It is going to cost silver. So, quick breakdown. I went over to the Microsoft page for the U.S. and you know, just a quick breakdown of cost. If you're going to buy silver, five dollars, five hundred silver, ten dollars, eleven hundred silver, twenty dollars, twenty three hundred silver, thirty dollars, thirty five hundred silver, fifty dollars, six thousand silver. You know, the more you spend, you get a little free silver for each of those tiers. But you're spending, putting down real money to do it. And with that, I went over to the U.K. No, I didn't actually. I couldn't be bothered. Um, you guys can look that up. And the same with the Australians. I do apologize. I was lazy. The yeah. Australians pretty much just just triple all those numbers, yeah. and that'll probably be about correct. So basically, just just send an actual silver bar to Bungie from Australia, and they'll give you some some silver back. That's basically what it's going to cost you. They have gold down there. down there. They don't have silver. Just send no, them all the gold. No, no. You have to. You. It says right here. You have to spend silver. They don't want your gold. They want <laughs> silver. It's very important. I don't mind this as long as in the Eververse you can still purchase the similar items or the same items for Bright Dust because I like just dismantling stuff and getting Bright Dust and then purchasing the exotic things that I want to get. So as long as it matches, you know, maybe about three weeks later I can purchase it with the Bright Dust, that's absolutely fine. I don't mind playing it that way. But if it's just going to be in that exclusive package for that week and that week alone and not be available with the um, bright dust, I'm not going to be happy with this change. Right. So there, so there, so I mean, they definitely said there will be, you know, an exclusive vanity item only available through that bundle. So there's at least something probably similar to the, to the, you know, I'm going to sit in Callus's chair emote that they sold, you know, individually through silver. Uh, there's probably things like that where they're like, Hey, we, you know, this is the thing where you have to buy the package for, it sounds like the other stuff, you know, it'll be a selection of other stuff you could get through Bright Dust, but there'll be those few things where you have to buy them. So we'll see how this plays out. Well, I just want to quickly go over with the seals for Destiny. So we detailed it a couple of weeks ago and we just reminded people about the seals that you can get for the, the Bungie pins that are available on the um, Bungie Rewards store. Basically, Bungie have addressed this in This Week at Bungie, saying that they've recognised from the community feedback about the requirements for some of the pins or the destination badges where you had to get, you had to rely on an RNG drop. So they're going to adjust this. Apparently, they're still collecting feedback and they're currently working on a change to drops with the associated badges for Dreaming City and The Last Wish Raid. So that is things like the ship and the ghost or sparrow that people are still missing. I think I am as well. And they're also looking into the Braytech weapons. So Jackley will be pleased with that. And the 1,000 voices to drop. So you'll be pleased with that, Respawn. And they're extending the time that you can get the pins from the Bungie Rewards. So the Bungie Reward offer for the premium seal pins has been extended from the 30th of March to August 31st. And they say codes that are redeemed from the Bungie Rewards page before February 28th will expire on April the 30th. If a code expires and the players are unable to use their code on the Bungie store in time, they should make a post on the Bungie Help page at forums describing the issue for assistance. Codes redeemed after February 28th, 2019 will need to be used in the Bungie store by the 30th of September 2019. Also with the seals, there's going to be a 
new seal and title coming with the season of the Drifter. So as promised last week, with Destiny Update 2.2.0, it will be resolving a number of issues that Destiny players have been subjected to over the last couple of months. And now we are looking at Resolved Issues Preview Part 3. So with Destiny 2 Update 2.2.0 closing in, here is the third and final preview of the player impacting issues that we expect to be resolved with Update 2.2.0 on March 5th. So, players who experience the above average guitar error in the final encounter of the Last Wish Raid, that's going to be fixed. Players who experience above average buffalo errors on PC, not sure entirely what that one's for. The blind well in the Dream City is not matchmaking players consistently, that's going to be fixed. That's That was a pain. Uh, gear items sometimes do not display the masterwork when previewed by other players. That's going to be fixed. Transferring gear with the Bungie.net API triggers repeated triumph notifications. So when you've used your Bungie app or your Destiny item manager app or the Ishtar app and you get those wonderful you've discovered a lost sector across the bottom of your screen, they'll be going away. They have also fixed an issue where Healing abilities in the Crucible activities subtract from the overall damage score reported in the post-game screen. The clan bounties sometimes do not count towards Hawthorne's weekly challenge. That will be fixed. Editor's note for that. This is due to a system change for Hawthorne in 2.2.0. The director may appear to be empty for players accessing Destiny 2 in Korea under some circumstances. The Antaeus wards do not consistently improve sliding, so that's going to be fixed, that'd be a good one. The scope on the Izanami's burden may sometimes be obstructed by the VFX uh, when ADSing while invading in Gambit or standing in the Well of Radiance. That's going to be fixed. The Le Monarch dot damage, that's going to be fixed, so when firing a poison arrow it was in inconsistently poisoning people over a long distance. Also, the Le Monarch appears in the kinetic weapon collections instead of the energy collection. Relevant scopes on the long shadow do not highlight enemies, that's going to be fixed. The mountaintop cannot use the quick access sling mod, that's going to be fixed. So I know a lot of people will be wanting to get that quick access sling on their grenade launchers. The star map shell do, does not detect chests in the Dreaming City, that's going to be fixed. And the striker sure hand some perks fail to activate Striker Sure Hand when it's fully masterworked. So that's the sword that you can get from the forges. That's now going to be fixed, so you can fully masterwork that and get the full damage from that now. If there's anything that you've missed over the last couple of weeks where we've detailed what they've detailed, what's going to happen, you can check up on the patch notes page, um, and we'll link that in the show notes. Another thing to point out from this week at Bungie is the changing of the seasons. So, Bungie say, with the season of the Forge nearing its end, we'd like to take this opportunity to remind players that the seasonal triumphs and objectives have until the start of Update 2.2.0's maintenance on March the 5th to be completed. At the weekly reset, Season of the Drifter will begin, ranks will be reset, and incomplete triumphs for the season of the Forge will expire. Here are some examples of what will reset or what will expire. So your Nightfall rank, that will go. Your Valor rank, that will be reset. Glory rank will be reset. Your Infamy rank will be reset. The Clan ranks will be reset. The Prismatic matrixes from the Season of the Forge will be removed and turned into Bright Dust. So it's 150 Bright Dust per Prismatic Matrix that you've got stored. Any incomplete triumphs or quests that require players to complete objectives in a single season all incomplete triumphs with the season 5 in the title will expire and be removed so you won't be able to find those in your inventories or your triumphs anymore going forward and they have some examples of items that will not reset or expire so quests for the pinnacle weapons for the season of the forge they won't expire any incomplete triumphs or quest steps that require players to complete objectives across all seasons and lastly a reminder Iron Banner Bounties from the Season of the Forge. Players who wish to redeem the powerful bounties must do so before March 5th. Again, more information, please see this week at Bungie for the 31st of January. Basically, you've got until the reset to turn those in. So if you're, they're just sitting in your inventory, check all your characters, make sure that you've turned them in. So, talking about Iron Banner, there's a new season coming 
and there's going to be some new changes to Iron Banner. So Lars Barkin from Bungie was speaking to IGN's Fireteam chat and gave a few hints at what we can expect. So, players can decrease their power in Iron Banner with an Iron Burden, which basically decreases your light up to a maximum of minus 100. Playing with this active can reward you a higher cadence of rewards and maybe additional cosmetic drops as well. This will come with an emblem that will track kills whilst you have the Iron Burden active. They did also go in to say that you can also increase your power with an Iron Buff to boost your light. So that's something to look forward to with the different changes in Iron Banner. Moving into the Destiny 2 Update 2.2.0, the deployment times. Parody, would you like to run us through that? Sure. So the Destiny 2 Update 2.2.0 deployment times starting on March 5th. At 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern, or 2 p.m. UTC, Destiny 2 maintenance begins. Your apps will stop working. Go to the vault if you need to get things. 45 minutes later, Destiny 2 is taken offline. If you're in an activity, you're going back to orbit. If you're trying to log in, you can't log in. Go play another game. Go do something else. Go listen to our podcast. you got some time. 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. UTC. Destiny 2 update 2.2.0 will begin rolling out across all platforms and all regions. Destiny 2 will be back online, so as soon as you download it and install it, you're good to go. At 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. UTC, maintenance is over, your apps will start working again, and you will be seized of the Drifter. There will be new bugs, there will be new content, go play it, go figure out which gun has double the aim assist, go figure out which gun is going to be a laser tag gun, it's going to be exciting. Before um, we move on to our spotlight section... Bungie Bounties, they're coming back. So they've got plans for new Gambit Prime Bungie Bounties in the next few weeks. They'll probably detail those in the this week at Bungie's. So they're going to be playing across Xbox, PlayStation, and PC. And in the Vidoc, I don't know if anybody else spotted this, but it has been pointed out by a few YouTubers and other podcasts that Season 7 was teased by Luke Smith with Season of Opulence. Where it looks mm. like we're going to return to the Leviathan. This is going to be around June time. Mm-hmm. And check the updated calendar because they've updated it now. And we'll put a link in the show notes for that. We're going to get real fancy. We're going to be opulent. It's going to be fancy. We're going to be wearing feather boas in the Crucible. It's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. So with Gambit Prime and the Reckoning being the main focus of the new DLC, we thought we'd highlight a few Gambit builds that you may be able to use at the moment they're a really good build for just your general armor and your your exotics and your normal perks and may be able to help you get a good leg up on the competition going into gambit prime so i'm going to link two videos by as to cross but both of them are for the warlock one of them is an arc build and one of them is a void build now the arc build uses the verity's brow and risk runner to basically chain your kills and your grenades. So with the Verity's Brow, if you throw a grenade down to trigger the Risk Runner kills um, and extra damage and the continuous reload, with your energy weapon getting constant kills with it, it, that will recharge your grenade. So if you run out, you can throw another grenade down and recharge your Risk Runner. And it's kind of a loop system. He shows you in the video a lot better than I'm actually explaining it. But it works really well with the middle subclass for the Warlock with the Lightning Beam. So if you've got an invader come in, you've got your super up really fast already and you can use your Light Beam to kill them or on the Primeval at the end. So that's worth a watch. And then the second video that he's done on a Warlock is with a Telesto and the Nezarek Sin. Again, very synergized with super mods and the Telesto getting extra kills feeds the Nezarex in which then feeds your super so have a look at those two videos I've also got a build for my titan that I work with and with that that is an arc titan with a middle tree subclass uh, insurmountable skull fort uh, risk runner I run it with three impact mods and two resilient mods with the crucible armor set apart from the helmet of course um, and it, they have all submachine gun perks on them so I have six mobility, nine resilience, and one recovery. And with that, again, it's pretty synergized. So I'm forever kind of leaping in the air and slamming down to the ground to kill a wave of enemies. 
And if I'm kind of stuck in a situation, you know, I can always throw a grenade down, trigger the risk runner and take out a few more enemies. Again, this is constantly building up your super. So I don't feel the need to have five super perks on there. So you can do that. You can change the build how you want to and how you run it. But I run it with these specific mods and this way. And I find that I get my super up before the first invaders in there. So as soon as the first invader comes in, I'm turning to look to see where they are. And then I'm flying with my super to hit them again, then turning back around, getting more moats, getting more kills, refeeding my super. So I've got another super up for the next invader. So it's kind of a, a chained effect with that. Um, and that's how I run my Titan. You're also missing one for the Warlock that I, I played this week and I saw a couple other folks play from the clan Andy and Pan where you run your Skull of Dire Armankara and your Slova Bomb. Because mm-hmm. that Skull of Dire Arm- Armankara is going to give you super energy for every Nova Bomb kill you get. So you take that Slova Bomb, you dump that on top of a group of ads, you basically have your super back immediately. During, especially during the Primeval sometimes, if there's, you know, when they spawn in, especially with, when they spawn in, there's lots of ads around them. I was able to get four Nova Bombs off in a row, basically, against one Primeval, just refilling it over and over and over and over again. And that yep. Skull of Dire Amonkara just refills refills and refills as you keep going. So if you have, if you get any orbs from anywhere else and, and you're dropping orbs that whole time, you're just you know raining orbs down on your team, too. Mm. So yeah, what I mean, we're it, saying here is that two Titans and a Hunter love Warlocks. Because Warlocks need love, too. Because honestly, in Gambit, that's one of those things that I love playing as a Warlock. Because I love I love my Titan Striker supers. They're great for clearing ads. They're not super great for doing that boss damage. But I, you get those Slova bombs in there, or you get that Chaos Reach with your Geomag Stabilizer. That eight seconds of death when you see that other team, and you're like, okay, we've got this. We're gonna win the game. And then all of a sudden, the bar just goes. They got Chaos Reached. You're done. There's nothing that wrecks as primeval like a Chaos Reach for eight seconds. So I know we've given love to the Titans and the Warlocks. Respawn, have you got some love for your hunter brother? Oh my brethren? god, do I? <laughs> okay, we have a lot of options, hunters. We're gonna go go ahead and get the obvious ones out of the way, right? So, tether with the um, the the Orpheus rigs, right? That's obvious. Tether Orpheus rig, gambit. It's amazing. And the great thing about the Orpheus rigs, right? You get it right back. Or if you're running around before the boss even spawns, you just fire it in the middle of a group of ads. Not only are you going to kill that whole group of ads if you and or your team is firing on it, but you get your super right back again for the next group of ads on the other side of the map, right? So that's just obvious. Now, if you want to get into more specifics, then we can go ahead and start with the Shards of Galanor for the um, for the Gunslinger. Gunslinger Middle Tree subclass, you have the Shards of Galanor. And what that does is the more enemies that you kill with the Shards of Galanor and your blade barrage, the more of your super you get back. Now, sometimes it's a little finicky. I've hit entire groups and only got a third. I've hit entire groups, got half. I've hit a couple of enemies and got all of it. Well, not all of it, but most of it back, right? So they're a little finicky. If you're good with the blades, by all means, go with that. If you're just looking to kill the red health bars and have your team take down uh, the yellow bars or whatever like that, then I highly, highly recommend the Ophidia Spathe chest piece with the throwing knives, double throwing knives. Because in Gambit, one throwing knife is usually 90% sufficient to kill a red bar, right? If you don't kill it or you miss, you got the second one. And for every kill that you get, you instantly refill both of your knives. So you just trek around the map, just throwing throwing knives, killing all the, the red bars, one or two shots. You clear them out actually surprisingly quick, and that way your enemy can deposit the moats, focus on the yellow bars, focus on the the... The blockers, right? So that's a little more niche. You got to be good with the throwing knives, but it's a lot of fun if you are. The other thing that I highly recommend, especially for boss damage, everyone's like, oh, well, you got to use the, uh... everyone's like, oh, you got to use the Celestial Nighthawk with the Gunslinger. Of course, you can do that. Absolutely a possibility. But what I personally use is I use the Radeon Flux with the Arc subclass because not only does it do a surprising amount of boss damage but whenever you let's say in the beginning of the match you have it in the beginning of the match you can take out both sides of enemies with one super and still have it charge back in time for the boss whenever he shows up 
So a couple of things that uh, that I don't know if we mentioned already before, but there's also two builds that are actually really good. And yes, I even have a Titan build. Uh, I, I haven't really seen anybody use it except me and one of my clan mates long, long time ago when it first came out. Um, but you use uh, the Titan exotic boots called the Peacekeepers, right? And what they do is they make your ready and uh, stow speed for submachine guns really, really fast. But in addition to that, Anytime you stow a submachine gun, it refills the ammo. So if you have a Huckleberry and the Escalation submachine gun, or you have a Risk Runner and any kind of a primary submachine gun, preferably one that's got like Rampage on it, all you got to do is literally just swap from one gun to the next while you're just running around killing all the things, right? So you don't have to reload. You never have to reload, actually. You have about a 99.8% uptime on an enemy because swapping from one machine gun to the next takes less than a second. It's so, so fast. So when one machine gun runs out of ammo, you just swap to the second one. Now, the good thing about uh, the Huckleberry is every time you get a kill, especially if, if you have the catalyst, it'll refill the entire magazine. If you don't have the catalyst, it'll just fill a portion. But either way, you're getting ammo in the magazine without actually having to reload and or swap. Conversely, when you, when you use the Risk Runner... If you're getting hit with arc damage, again, it's automatically loading your magazine. So you don't really have to swap back and forth a lot with those two guns. That's one of the things that make this build really great. And the off chance that you do somehow run out of ammo with these weapons, you just swap to the other submachine gun, empty that clip, swap back, and then now you've got a full clip again to start your rampage all over again. It's amazing. We were getting like, I don't even know, 30, 40 kills in the Crucible. We were also doing mad damage instead of gambit. It's it is actually bonkers. Now, don't get me wrong. Boss damage is a little lacking. That's why you have to have like a hammerhead or a really good heavy for the boss damage. But as far as ads go, and as far as other players go in PvP, it is absolutely destructive. Moving from the Titan back to the Warlock that we were talking about earlier, there's a build that I like to use. Um, I don't know if anybody really does this beside me. I've never seen anybody do it. But everybody knows the Nezarek Sin with the Telesto combo, right? And everyone thinks you have to have a Void subclass to make it super synergetic or whatever. But honestly speaking, the only thing the Void subclass is going to do, it's going to give you a Void Melee and a Void Grenade. You're not going to be using those all the time, right? Because they have a cooldown. So what I did is I packed my armor with special ammo, special ammo finder, right? And I use the middle tree on the Arc Warlock subclass. And what that middle tree on the Arc subclass does is every time you get a kill, you get one of those tetrahedrons that kind of make their way back to you. And that refills all of your abilities. It fills your super, fills your melee, fills your rift, fills, fills everything, right? So you use the Nezarak Sin with the Telesto to charge your super. And then each one of those tetrahedrons you get from killing an enemy also charge your super. And all of your other abilities. So that is an absolutely amazing build. Whenever I use it, I get my super back once a minute or so, if that. So if you guys haven't tried that, I highly, highly recommend you using it inside of Gambit. It is a monster, monster build to use for the Warlock. And another Warlock build that you can use is with the Phoenix Protocol and the middle uh, Dawnbreaker tree for the Warlock. What that does is obviously whenever you get a kill or an assist, it gives you your super back faster. But in Gambit, you got ads everywhere, right? So you pop down a rift, you give your teammates healing, you give your teammates extra damage, you kill all the ads, you got your super back. You go to the next area, put your super down, kill the ads, or even get assists. If you have an auto rifle, just strafe the crowd for every enemy that gets killed. You get credit for it, and it'll help recharge your super. Now, I know what people are thinking. What about the boss damage? It's not great for boss damage. Ideally, you're right. You really want to have more boss damage. But if you have the rift down... It will empower all of your ally shots while keeping them alive with all the boss ads shooting at them. And depending on who invades, it might also keep you alive with an invader. So it's a really, really good build. It's a little lackluster when it comes to the boss damage department. But at that point in time, just have a team you can trust and you'll be fine. I just wanted to add another Titan build that I found by Chris P. Bacon, 808. And it centralizes around the Master of the Quiet one and the Siege Breaker for the Sunbreaker Titans and he goes into explaining how you can basically tank a lot of damage with the Mask of the Quiet one and recharge your super really really fast so that's another one to check out in Gambit I mean he says that it's worth trying it in raids it's worth trying it in strikes and things but it was another one that I thought would be quite interesting for the Titans 
So check that one out as well. So as we come to the end of the show, we'd like to do a weapon spotlight. And this week we wanted to spotlight another auto rifle. This is a high impact and slow rate of fire with a good roll. Increasable can do some really good damage. It is the Half Dan D. I'll link a video by Aztacross who goes over some of the best perks to look out for and shows you basically what the weapon can do in PvP with those rolls. This is a auto rifle that you can get from the gunsmith. It can be a well drop so it's one to look out for and if you like your scout rifles at a longer range this might be one for you. So what what are you guys looking forward to in the new season of the Drifter stuff? Is there anything that you're eyeing just going, I must have that, I must play that, that's the thing I need? I'm definitely going for the Gambit. And more importantly, I'm, go I'm going for the armor that does more damage against invaders because I'm just waiting for that Titan to come in thinking, yeah, I'm going to one-shot my shoulder bash, and then I'm going to wreck him. <laughs> you know? That's going to be my gear. I'm going to get as many pieces as it takes to give me extra damage against invaders, and the rest of it is going to be extra damage against uh, ads. So which which thing are you guys most excited to play? I'm I'm... I'm, de I'm definitely torn between the I'm going to bake all the moats and I'm going to destroy all the blockers because that's sort of the role I tend to take up anyway is I, I destroy a blocker, I try to leave the bank, I destroy another blocker, I try to leave the I'm bank. I'm just going to destroy everything. I like the way this man thinks. I dig it. <laughs> you saw me play the other day. I'm going to destroy everything. Flying <laughs> Titans around the map. Right. Yes. So I think that's it, guys. That's the end of the show. Just want to thank everybody for downloading and listening to us once again. And check out all the links below. We'll link everything that we can and just check them out. There may be something that you've missed or maybe something that, you know, we've missed mentioning in the podcast that we've linked below. But we've tried to catch everything. So it's over to Parody to close the show. Your Titans have been Parody and Night Demon. Your Hunter is no one respawns in real life. No respawn is no one respawns. Yeah, I N R L on Xbox Live and nowhere else because he doesn't love you and doesn't want to talk to you. This has been Parody, P E R O T Y, and Night Demon, N I T E D E M O N. You can find us on Xbox Live or on Twitter. If you want to tell Respawn he's wrong, you can email two Titans and a Hunter at hotmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash the number two Titans underscore Hunter. You can find our Frozen Clan page at join.frozen.party. There's a zero in Frozen. You can find us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Spotify, on anywhere you can download this podcast. Download the podcast. We're at twotitansandahunter.podpeen.com. That'll give you all the ways to find us. Until next week. The Reckoning. As we go you're, not, you're not my real dad. Um, kind of curious how those two things fit together. A little scared, but I'm going to let it go. Thank you for coming for The Reckoning. 